Hello, folks. Welcome to a very special episode of Smoke Em If You Got Em, the world's most interactive music journal. That's a fact. My name's G, the crazy Hispanic, but there's no need to panic. And on the other side of the microphone is the man with a plan that has it all figured out, the Oracle of Oxford County, Jeremiah Charlton. Please introduce us to what we're doing today, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, the journey that we will go on together is the great Keith Jarrett, Fort Yawa. How long did it take you to figure out that's how you say the name of this album? Because I, I stood looking at this written out for a while. Uh, I just figured it out right now, to tell you the truth. Nice. I like that. Improv. This is a, this is a crazy dope record. What year is this uh, album? 1973, folks. It's right in the sweet spot when music was good. I, you know, Keith Jarrett's such a huge thing that we're going to discuss at length here. But, you know, this is this is episode number 20 of the second season of Smoker Movie Got Him. So you got to teach these people a little bit about Keith Jarrett. We talked a little bit in the last episode, but since we're about to, like, put this down, you want to give the folks some, some context on Keith Jarrett? Well, Keith Jarrett is... I mean, one of the greatest piano players of all time. I think a, a true musical genius. Uh, he got brought into prominence, played for um, Art Blakey, the Jazz Messengers, as a young Ooh. man. Ooh. Then he went to Charles Lloyd Jeez. and uh, with the great Jack DeJanet and played in that group, J- Charles Lloyd Quartet. And then Jack and Keith joined the great Miles Davis <sighs> for albums like Live Evil. Uh, I th- but the weird thing about Keith Jarrett, and then Keith went on his own after that. Yeah, I think he put on a Kenny Wheeler album, and then I don't know how much like, uh, Gary. Well, if you count things like him and Gary Burton, but yeah. he didn't really do any sideman work, which is so strange for jazz people. But not uh, strange for the character of Kenny of Kenny Jarrett. Yeah, Keith Jarrett. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, Keith, yeah, that's his brother. He's a very strange fellow. Yeah, Kenny's not so, a good guy. Yeah, Keith's much nicer. No, Keith is very strange himself. Idiosyncratic, I guess, would be the... Oh, yeah, there you go. It is a Sunday word. There you go. So, we're going to enjoy this journey, so you better have one. Uh, What's the rules? Tell them, G. Well, now that we got that down, I mean, the the rules of the show is always the same deal. You got to have two joints ready. You got to have two numbers ready, prepped, ready to go. We're going to smoke one. We're going to play the A side. We're going to smoke another one and play the B side. We're going to talk about and have a good time, because today we're learning about the grief. Keith Jarrett on this uh on this great episode number 20 of season two of smoke them we got them so let them know smoke them we got them folks let's go oof fort yawa fort yawa fort yawa keith jarrett the american quartet please talk about the american quartet before we go anywhere on this so Keith Jarrett, I would say, is mostly most famous for the Cologne concert, yeah. which is a solo piano uh, concert which sold millions of records, <laughs> which is insane. Um, and then in recent times, he either does solo work or a trio where they play jazz standards with Jack DeJanet and Gary Peacock. And that's where I think most people think of Keith Jarrett. That's what they think of. It was, it, would that be? That's, that's a fair assessment. That's a fair assessment for sure. Uh, and was that your take as well? To him? 100%. I, mean, not, not, uh, not, even, not, I know you don't for a while, but... I've known him for initially. a while, but, but before I got to know him deeper, uh, yeah, it was, I, had, I had a copy of the Cone concert, because anybody, anybody that's anybody can find this record. I mean, when he says millions of copies sold, this record spawned a whole record label, spawned a whole slew of other artists. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, so, yeah, but mostly well known for that, and then the trio work, for sure. So earlier, he had two quartets. He had a European quartet and the American quartet. How they, hip is that, by the way? Yeah, and they were both different soundings. The American quartet also, Keith was so cool, he had the ECM thing uh, signed, but he also was signed to Impulse with the American quartet at the same exact time. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So that's, that's how good, cool. That's how good Keith Jarrett is. He's allowed to have two different bands running on opposing labels and still put them out at the same time. Correct. And uh, the American Quartet has the my favorite, uh, really bass and drum combo in jazz, with Paul Motion and Charlie Hayden. 
And and why so, and why is that? Why um, there's so many there's so many combos and these sort of like killers around and legends that can play out of a bag. But why why do these two call you out so much? One because of Charlie Hayden's. Charlie Hayden plays mm, at time. I'm not gonna say he plays less, but he's just he's very judicious with his note choices. Yeah, more more than like more than most, right? And he's always changing the harmony notes underneath. Uh, so that creates a lot of uncertainty because of his time with obviously Ornette Coleman. Yeah. Uh, he brings that same thing over and then Paul motion <sighs> on drums. He just doesn't play drums like any other people. He literally at times sounds like throwing a bag of luggage down a flight of stairs. Paul motions concept of the way the one rhythmically lies, uh, is very different than everybody else's one. And I think when you got two magicians that are building, that are building this this other thing together, that both are capable of hiding the one or hiding this, the place where everything starts. Um, it, it gives you for for a great spot for such a a crazy musician and composer as T. Jarrett, because he loves to fill in the gaps. You know, no wasted space. And uh, these are three, and especially with Jarrett, you know, they're all students of the game. And then, of course, the great Dewey Rebin on saxophone. So what did you think of uh, the first two tracks? Listening to, listening to uh, this record from 73, uh, it reminded me of my own personal journey getting into Jared in terms of uh, when I first got into Keith Jared, uh, my brain couldn't comprehend. My ears were not there. I'm not saying that I totally get it now, but I definitely get it much more. It took me a while to get through the first two tracks. Um, it is impressive. It is kind of a feat of strength. And nobody sounds at the piano like Keith Jarrett. I mean, the the fact that this is a live club and you can hear a needle drop. Live at a the Vanguard. Drop. Oh, a needle drop at a bar with people drinking out of glass and moving and smoking inside. You can't hear a single thing because everybody's so glued onto what's happening. It, the level of energy that's put out in the first two tracks of this is out of control. But it reminded me a lot of that. You know, like... Lots of music, lots of notes, fast tempos. Um, the idea of like jazz musicians working on a live bandstand, like the like the Vanguard, right? To me, the, the what stood out was Dewey Redmond's first solo on the sax, where he's screaming, literally screaming through the horn. Yeah. And uh, when I say that, folks, it's not not a metaphor. Like he literally yells and screams through the horn. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very, it's it's very uh guttural it's death metal inside of jazz for real did you did your ear travel to any certain uh player more than others in the first half did you did you find yourself listening to certain instruments I sat, more I, I sat with keith on that first and second track the whole way through and i had to listen to this album a second time around too you're trying to ride that <laughs> oh it was just a different um I just can't stress how, how fast and how many notes, how many notes. I mean, we talked about this last night. I, I called you and I said, hey, I can't get through it because yeah. my brain was not in that place. And, you know, and, the, and you very wisely said, hey, let, let it drop, hit it tomorrow and fill your head with this thing first. And pff, wow, what a difference. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a type of music where you cannot uh, ignore it. Absolutely. Or it'll, or, or it'll, it'll annoy you. <laughs> oh, it'll, t- it'll take you out if you don't give it the, the proper respect that it's demanded. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so are you ready for the second half or what? Hell yeah, I am. Let's go do this. Uh, folks, right, cool. uh, you know, drop, drop everything you're doing. It's if Sunday. At this point you haven't, yeah, if at this point you haven't stopped whatever the hell you're doing that is not listening to this album, uh, what the fuck are you doing? Go and spark up that other number. I know, I know that you think, hey, I got shit to do. You don't got shit to do. It's Sunday. You got to listen to Keith Jarrett with us and listen to us talk about this because, hey, we're giving you the good shit. This is how you hip up your life. Let's do it, folks. Put the Instagram down, okay? Leave the hoes alone. Smoke if you got them. Let's go. Oof. Please let them know what record we're listening to. Please. Fort Yawa. Keith Jarrett, Fort Yawa.
this is a live album from the Vanguard. It feels like you're sitting in there. Now now we're really cooking with gas up in this side. The drums d- 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 destroyed me. <laughs> this is where business picked up for you. Oh, I am. I am in it. And now at this point, I don't just listen to Keith. Now I got everybody's scope inside my head. Uh, what did you think about um, this? This one to me, it, it it had a lot of groove. It had a lot of so much groove for seventy three of the Vanguard. Yeah, Charlie Hayden laying it down, so letting letting the drums sort of dance all over. Can we can we talk a little bit about Charlie Hayden? Uh, because in terms of uh, musicians, you know, when you talk about people that play the double bass and you know. There is a very, there's a sound that most people that don't listen to a lot of music or don't recognize jazz as much, you know, there's a sound to the upright bass that you recognize. Somehow Charlie Hayden is able to not get that sound. The natural sound of you hitting a string against an upright bass. Charlie Hayden has a whole different touch. He has one of the very few distinct upright sounds. There are, there are, there are others, but... Yeah, no one does sound him. like you can him. Count him. It's it's not even it's not even a it's not even a, 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 a it's not a competition. You no, I'm saying? like there's no competition here. Charlie Hayden is Charlie Hayden. Yes, and and not only not only was he a bad bad motherfucker playing the upright bass, he also took a lot of his uh, his activism went through music, like his aggression through the bass, the pieces that he wrote for the Liberation Orchestra. I mean, Charlie Hayden is a deep deep bad motherfucker that if you don't know about him just go and look for him because everything you'll find is great yeah I, I love this now folks because of keith jarrett has a very wide insane discography so if you like this it's not a guarantee you're gonna like other things by him absolutely you know and, and vice versa if you didn't like this that doesn't mean you're not gonna like something else by him right like he he is very diverse in terms of styles of music within the classical and jazz genre. Yeah, his his take on just songwriting in general. I mean, when you when you call him a genius, it's come from the point of reference that not only does he excel in one place or two places, but it's various, it's different different places. And everything is at the highest degree, at the highest level, right? It's just it's impressive. So what you're, I'm assuming your favorite track was the drums. The, 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 the drums, yeah. And uh, what's the track that happens after the drums? What's still the, life, still so, still. So still life, still life, and the drums. You know, those to me were the standout tracks. Uh, just I was not expecting this band to swing so hard or go these places, considering the side that we just came from. Does that make sense? Yes, going back to what we just said, like even this band can be diverse with yeah. uh, in the same album, and they have multiple albums, and I, I recommend them all with 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 this this group of guys. Yeah, what stands out uh, for you on this on the B side of this album? Paul Motion. Yeah, Paul Motion because um, is there, I, I, don't you hear like a tambourine? going on too at times uh, it sounds like there's some this either jingle clasps or or yeah or just a wooden tambourine that goes off of crazy, right like the, i heard a tambourine like going off while he's playing basically like uh the entire floor game. tom you know yep. like he's got a floor tom going on so it's like damn yeah he, yeah, he, like... stood, he stood out way more on this one yeah the first. well i i think i think also keith you know and the not trying to speak out of school, but I feel like Jared also pulls back a little bit on this B side. And you can tell this is recorded a couple of different nights and they put together like the best tunes. Uh, but the quality of this vinyl, right? Can we talk about the sound quality of this? Yeah. It's just, you sound, it sounds like you're sitting at the Vanguard. I've been to the Vanguard myself. It sounds like you're sitting at the Vanguard. It's impulse. It's an impulse record. One of the, the impulse is serious. There's 12 uh, American Quartet albums. 12 of them. Yeah. I think I have all but one. Nice. Bastards. <laughs> so, close but no cigar. I mean, yeah, almost. And, and we've, ta- and we've talked Damn about it. this uh, a couple of uh, a couple of episodes back where, you know, 
Keith Jarrett you put over his discography and like the amount of records you own from for his work. But there's uh, how long did it? Pre- most people don't know this little peek behind the curtain, but uh, the Oracle has listened to a lot of music, as you guys can gather. You know, the man, the man is a uh, master level when it comes to like listening to music and collecting music. And uh, at one point, he was listening. Well, not at one point. He's done this a couple of times, but he was listening through his discography, his collection. And uh, how long? In in then this is alphabetical order. How long did it take you to go through your Keith Jarrett section? Well, I've listened to all my Keith Jarrett records in a row, at least twice, if not three times. Right, and I have forty six albums by him. And and a lot of these are not single records. A lot of these, a lot of those are doubles. You know. Yep. Yep. So it took a long time. Like I, I, I really wouldn't know. Like depending on what my work schedule was at the time, because it's different now with the, the COVID times. But this was yeah. pre COVID times. This is a lot of work and. Well, I mean, well, the, just the, just the concept of you having to schedule time to go through the collection. It was on there for probably like weeks, two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks, I would say. I'm just listening to Keith Jarrett, like, when I was at home putting records on. You were down a real K-hole on that one. Yes. So, um, so if anybody that haven't haven't spent any time with Keith Jarrett and and, and this quartet, if they wanted to go and check something else out, can you give them two examples of what would be two good places to go that they wouldn't be so, uh, so drowning in the water as Keith Jarrett? Uh, Boppy. Is the Boppy and Baya Blue are the the final two albums by the American Quartet, and they're fucking incredible. Well, there you go. Yeah, there you go. That's what you got to do. Now, uh, do we have any stats on cost of this album? The man for very affordable, very affordable album because there's lots of them, lots of different uh, pressings available. Mm. So you can get an original U.S. copy for I would say fifteen bucks 20 bucks wow well, there you go there's lots there's lots lots of pressings always great quality albums that are put out because keith jared pays a lot of attention to how the vinyls pressed the quality of the vinyl and uh and the quality of the master pressing you know deepest oh, grooves it's e- i mean ecm everything. this is impulse that's funny like an impulse is great too but yeah keith jared's basically known as an ecm artist you know. Yeah, I mean he's he's carried he's carried that label forever since the Cone concert. I mean it's it's one of those things. And and Impulse, if you if you don't know about Impulse, the Impulse story is a great documentary to look on this. And they also have a compendium uh, record collection on Impulse that you know you get the best the best out of this. But yeah, ECM. We'll talk about ECM at length at some point here on Smoking If You Got Him. But whew, what a label. So I guess our next episode is going to be a, a review of our, our top 20. Is that what we're going to do? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think – here's the deal. We did 25 last time. Oh, well, we have time to go. So then. I Jeez. think we should go – I think we should oh, go over the 25. Please, a please. Big five-all review. And, yeah, top uh, 25. And, yeah, and go for it. I, I did have a question to ask you uh, when it comes to – when it comes to music mediums, uh, you put vinyl over – most of the audio media, correct? Uh, vinyl's at the top, yes, for me. Yeah, and so can you talk a little bit about why vinyl is the best in terms of, like, why does it affect you like that? I guess people always talk about the warmth of the sound, but you got to have a good record player. you got to have a good needle. All these things. The record has to be clean. These, these are all <laughs> yeah. very important things to getting an actual great vinyl sound. Uh CDs, you know, CDs got a bad rap, and, and it's just uh, CDs. I can't listen to vinyl in my car, right? So it's more like the MP3s, and now obviously it's getting better, and and they're trying all the time. But uh, the the warmth, the bass response of a vinyl record, the sound, yeah. the sound of a live album, like, like something like this, like a like a jazz album. When you have a vinyl, it, it literally you sound like you're in the room if you're you have a good system. Yeah, it happens a lot also with uh, with Latin music. You know, uh, a lot of uh, salsa and merengue and all these sort of uh, where, you, where you have a big band and it's in front of a you know it's a live room. Would you call it a live room? Uh, it comes through on analog and a crazy, and it hits you in a very different way. And you're right; it's about the components as well. Because if you 
it's it's like having it's like having a Rolls Royce, right? But putting like Honda tires on it. You got you, it's got to be the whole thing, or otherwise you're cutting yourself halfway out. Well, where do we want to go next time, buddy? Tell you me know, that. you know, uh, we should. Um, we're here with Keith. We're having a good time. We've been in America. I've been in America long enough. Uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back to the Asian continent. We're going back to Japan. Yeah, let's go over there and dig dig deep over there. Okay. Now, do you want Japan, or do you or are, are, are you wanting are you wanting uh, understanding the limitation understanding the limitations of looking wild for information about Asia? You know what? Fuck it. Wild card. Asia. Wild card. Wild card Let's Asia. Beautiful. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Tomorrow, smoke we've got them. We will be in Asia. Most likely in some strange prog noise, jazz, fusion trip rock, out. trip psych. Not really. Yeah, their version trip psych, but I'm I'm down with it. That's yeah, we're there. Smoke if you got them. Peace.